Hello and welcome to your first AP Calc flipped classroom video. Today we're going to look at section 1.1 which deals with a preview of calculus. Now the main I, or the main point behind this section is kind of to look at the differences between calc and pre-calc. So the first thing we're going to look at is what is calculus. In a nutshell, calculate, or calculus is the mathematics of change. And when we talk about change, we're talking about velocities, acceleration, tangent lines, slopes, areas, volumes, etc. Now, these concepts have enabled your scientists and engineers and economists um, to use these type of concepts to model real-life situations. That's kind of like the big piece of calculus. Now the biggest difference between your pre-calc and your calculus is pre-calculus is what we call more static and calculus is more dynamic. In other words, pre-calc is kind of like the 2D version. Um, it doesn't, like it has application, but you really need to get to that 3D or the dynamic piece of calculus in order to do more complex calculations. Now, the goal in calculus, um, aside from learning the material itself, is to learn how to model and solve your real-life problems. So to do this, we're going to have to reformulate your pre-calc math by using that limit process, and we will go over the limit process in class. You do have these examples in your book, um, but just a few things that we can kind of look over here real quick is uh, like this example that says an object traveling at a constant velocity can be analyzed with pre-calc, but then if you want to look at the actual velocity of the accelerating object, you have to have the calculus piece to that. You cannot, when we're looking at velocity that's changing because of acceleration, you have to have calc. You cannot do that with pre-calculus. Um, likewise, if you're looking at the slope of a line, you can use pre-calc for that, but if you want to look at the slope of a curve, you need calculus. And when we're talking about a curve, we're talking about something that might look like this. To where in calculus, or I'm sorry, in pre-calc, you can only analyze something that maybe looks like this or this. Now, I actually thought this was kind of a cute way to uh, phrase what is calculus. Your book uses the example that calculus is like a limit machine, and it involves three stages. Your first stage is your pre-calc math, which you guys took last year. Okay, and this is your basics of your slopes, your areas, etc. Then you have what we learned at the end of last year called the limit process. Now that limit process is kind of that connecting piece between the pre-calc and then your calc. So we learned how to do pre-calc last year. We started in with the limit process, and now we're going to transition from that limit process to what's coming up called our derivatives, which we did do a little bit last year, and integrals. And the derivative and integrals are all in that calculus piece. So again, here are some more examples of the differences with calculus and without calculus. When you look at functions like this here, you can find the value of f of x when x equals c without calculus, but if you want to find the limit as x is approaching c from either direction, you need to have the calculus piece. Okay. Likewise, if you want to find the slope of a secant line to a curve, you can find that without calculus, but if you want to find the slope of that tangent, you need, again, the limit process to help you find the slope of that tangent. Okay. Same thing with average rate of change. Um, we can calculate average rate of change using, using pre-calc, but you, if you want to do instantaneous, or at a specific time, you need to actually have calculus for that. In pre-calc, you can find the area of a rectangle, but you need the calc piece to go and find the area underneath a curve. In pre-calc, you can find work done by a constant force, but when our force is no longer constant, as it usually is in the real world, we need to use something like calc to help us find that. Now another thing that we'll get into at the end of the year, with pre-calc we can find surface areas of cylinders or masses of solids with constant densities. But with calc, we can actually find the surface area of a solid of revolution, like some of these pieces. And this again will 
come later on at the end of the year. The last two things we're going to look at in section 1.1 are the two most popular types of calc problems. One is what we call the tangent line problem. With the tangent line problem, we are typically given some function and some point on the graph and we're asked to find the, an equation of the tangent line to the graph at the point. Okay, and you can kind of see what this looks like. So here we have our function, we're given our point, and we want to find the equation of this tangent line. Very, very classic calc type problem. And unless we're dealing with a vertical tangent line, the problem of finding a tangent line at the, P, at the point P is the same thing as finding the slope of the tangent line at P. And if you remember back from pre-calc, we actually did this by first finding the secant line and we would you have your point P here and then we have some other point out um, on the graph somewhere else and because you have two points and they both fall on the same line or the secant line here you can actually calculate the slope of that secant so the slope of the secant is really found by finding the differences in your y values just like you would for a normal slope so we're going to take y2 minus y1, divide that by the quantity of x2 minus x1. Now in the case of calc, our equation looks a little more complicated, but these are still my y values here and here, and these are still the changes in our x values. So that leads to something that looks like this, um, where initially we are looking at this point P and this point Q, but if you recall from last year, if we shifted this point Q down here, we got a new slope. And that the slope of this new secant line is a little bit closer to, to the original tangent line. And if we move this new point Q to another new point Q that is again closer to P, we're going to get a, a, a slope of a secant line that's even closer yet to that tangent. So ultimately we're going to continue to move that point Q closer and closer and we're going to approximate the slope of the tangent and that is really what the limit process is doing. The second type of classic calc problem we're going to deal with is called the area problem. Okay, It's similar to that of the tangent line. We are What we're doing is we're going to use the limit process to apply it to the areas of rectangles of some specified region. So if you look at an example of something like this where we're given a general function and we want to find the area under the curve between A and B, um, you could go ahead and subdivide this into rectangles. And depending on the width of those rectangles, obviously the smaller they are, the more accurate they will be. And that's actually what we'll see here on this slide. So if I have wider triangles, or I'm sorry, rectangles, then we're going to have maybe not quite as accurate of a calculated area as if we went ahead and made smaller rectangles. Now again, the more rectangles we have, the closer our answer will be and that's kind of where that limit ties in. So the more rectangles you have, the more accurate that area is going to be when you calculate it out. And now for your fun fact. Doo -doo -doo -doo. Your fun fact today deals with the term x-ray. The x-ray was discovered by Nobel Prize winning physicist Wilhelm Conrad Röntgen and is called the Röntgen Ray by those in the field today. Röntgen himself called his discovery the X-ray, borrowing the X from the algebraic symbol for the unknown. His discovery was purely accidental and at the time difficult for him to comprehend, and therefore he began to refer to it as the unknown or the X-factor, which now is the X-ray. So hopefully you have a great day, and we will see you in class tomorrow.